Well, good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It, it is such a blessing to get to be together, to worship with one another on, on this beautiful Sunday morning. We, we thank you for being here, however you may be with us today. We hope that you feel the grace and the warmth and the love of Jesus Christ. Now, I, I do have a, a couple of announcements for us this morning. Uh, first off, the, the hot dog ministry again delivered hot dogs uh, this week, delivered a little over 260 hot dogs out to our community. It continues to be a wonderful way that, that we're living into that calling to be the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ here in Cherryville. And I want to thank everyone who donates to that, everyone who prays for that ministry to, to make it the blessing that it is here in this community. Uh, also, if you have not had the opportunity to watch Mrs. Bess's lesson, uh, it was posted on our Facebook this Wednesday. Go back and watch that and then eagerly await another Wednesday to watch uh, Bess's lesson. That will be posted on Wednesday at 5. Uh, also, if you have not had the opportunity to watch Betsy Beatty's Sunday School lesson, I highly encourage you to do so. It, it continues to be a wonderful way that our church is reaching out trying to stay connected even in these difficult times. And also, to today it is a special day in the life of First United Methodist Church here at Cherryville. We, we have a Duke student uh, who's going to be with us over the course of this summer. Now, his name is Sean, and he will be with us virtually uh, at first and, and hopefully in person a little bit later uh, throughout the summer, but, but many of you are going have the opportunity to get to speak with Sean on the telephone, and I'm going to let Sean introduce himself to you today. Hey, First United Methodist Cherryville. My name is Sean Timmons, and I'm the Duke Divinity intern this summer. Reverend Christie has asked me to take a couple minutes and make this video as a bit of an introduction uh, from me to you all. Uh, so here we go. Uh, I was born and raised in a town called Pocosin, Virginia, which is on the eastern coast of Virginia. So if you've ever been to Yorktown or Williamsburg, maybe you've heard of Bush Gardens. That's where it's near. So if you've ever heard of any of those places or care to look up any of those places or look up Pocosin, uh, that's where I'm from. So I was raised in the church. You know, first 18 years of my life, but it wasn't until I was 13 years old that I was baptized, that I made the conscious decision uh, to follow Christ. At the time, I really had no clue what that meant. Uh, I just knew it needed to happen. Uh, even to this day, I don't fully know all that God has in store for my life, but certainly back then, I hadn't a clue. So the next few years was a lot of praying, a lot of discerning, trying to understand what following Christ looked like for Sean Timmons. And over time and with the guidance of my youth pastor, uh, I, I was able to recognize a call towards ministry, not just, you know, in general, but a, a lifelong vocational call to ministry uh, and specifically to youth ministry. And so because of that uh, call in my life, that recognition of that call, and the slow but eventual acceptance of that call, I went to uh, a small college called Chowan University in Murfreesboro, North Carolina, where I got a Bachelor of Religion with minors in English and Missions. And then after that, I went to Duke Divinity School, where I just completed my first year working towards a Master of Divinity degree. Uh, along with that, I have been serving in churches as youth ministry interns for the past four years. Uh, three of those years were in Murfreesboro. One of those years has been in Durham at a church called Hope Valley Baptist. Uh, so yeah, that's just a little bit about uh, my education background, a little bit about my, my ministry background and how I've gotten to this point making this um, video for you all on June 11th, 2020. Uh, a couple of just quick fun facts about me. Uh, I really, really loved reading. 
and, <laughs> and not just like for school type reading. Like actually, if I have free time, I will sit down and read a book. Um, it's great. I love it. Uh, some of my favorite book genres are, uh, well, clearly faith, church history, um, history in general, novels, uh, and, and classics are probably some of my, my favorite genres out there. I'll read just about anything, but those are definitely up there. Uh, so if you have book suggestions, I am all for them. Uh, I also really enjoy cooking. Uh, this isn't something that I really started picking up until the last couple years because I didn't have a kitchen of my own to experiment with. Uh, but my senior year at Chowan, I got my own apartment, my own kitchen. Um, and, and so I've been able to you know, experiment with cooking. So I really enjoy doing that as well. Um, with, of course, there's a lot of other things that I, I enjoy and a lot more stuff to me than just what I've said thus far, um, but hopefully you'll get to hear more about that as we uh, get to know each other throughout the summer. Um, so with all that being said, um, I, I must point out that I am disappointed and sad that I won't be in Cherryville in person, at least for the time being, because of the current situation with COVID-19. Um, However, I am still very excited to work with you all to serve the church and to serve um, alongside you in the Cherryville community to the best of my ability, given the circumstances. Uh, so yeah, I, I have already gotten to meet Reverend Christy. I've already gotten to meet Miss Bess and Miss Teresa in the office. Um, and I very much look forward to meeting to meeting all of you. Um, and getting to know all of you and serve alongside you this summer. Um, so I will hopefully get to talk to all of you very soon. Uh, but with that being said, grace and peace, friends, and um, look forward to working with all of you and meeting you. See ya. And now, let us come together to worship God in both spirit and in truth. Thank you. As we come to this time of prayer in our worship service, I, I would like to remind you uh, of a couple things. Uh, first off, if you have any prayer requests, please feel free to, to call those into the church office throughout the week. And also, we have a prayer box at the front of the church, and, and I would encourage you to go and, and write a prayer request down and put it on that box. The, the box is set out each morning. It comes in in the evenings, but, but another way for you to give your prayer requests to this church, and, and they will be lifted up in prayer. As we come to this time of prayer, we'll, we'll begin with a time of silent prayer, then we'll have a spoken prayer, then we'll come together for the Lord's Prayer. Brothers and sisters, let us go to God.
Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you nothing is hidden. We give you thanks for the gift of this new day. We give you thanks for your grace and your love that you have poured out upon your creation on this day. And we pray that you would use this time of worship to shape and to form us so that we may more fully embody discipleship in our lives. Lord God, we know that from your first gaze, no one is lost. And in your great love, all can be found. Yet we also know that there are many who do not wish to be found. We know that there are many here in this community who have yet to hear the redemptive and good news of Jesus Christ. By your Holy Spirit, Lord, we pray that you would empower us to be your hands and feet in order that our words and our actions may bear witness to your grace and your love. For we know grace and love are what bring even the most lost in this world. Heavenly Father, when we survey your world, we see a world in desperate need of healing and restoration. Lord, we see the pain wrought by this coronavirus. We see anguish in our streets. Father, we pray your healing hand may be upon all who suffer. We pray that all who call out to you may feel your love. And Lord, we pray for all those who are lost here in our community, that they may feel themselves being called home by your grace. We pray for those who have no one else to pray for them, Lord, that they might remember in your great grace and in your great love, they can always be found. And we pray that you would make us aware of the needs that exist here in our community in order that we might be your hands and your feet here today. This morning, we lift before you Billy and Mike, Janet and Van, the Dellinger family and Deborah, Vera and Jim, Keith and Ruth, Sherry and Janice, Ken and Bertha, Ara Ann and Larry, Sue and Carlene, Joe and Chris, Gary and Ron, Earlene and Marty, Betty and Rhett, Lisa and Brandon, Teresa and Walter, Katie and Sherry, the Shrum family and Beverly. Lauren and Martha Jane, Ethan and Aaron, Jessica and Cody, and all those names and situations that we hold on our hearts. Lord, we lift them into your holy hands. We pray for the leaders of Cherryville, of Gaston County, the state of North Carolina, the United States and the world. We pray that all those entrusted with leadership may look to you for guidance, wisdom, and discernment. We pray for all those who love and serve their communities. And we pray that they may feel your strength as they seek to love their neighbors. We pray for our soldiers, for their safe return, and for an end to war. And now, as those who have been called disciples, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught each of us by praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. And now uh, I'm going to turn it over to Miss Bess. Good morning, my young friends. I hope you're having a good Sunday. I'm glad to have everybody joining with us as children and those children of God. 
Today is sort of a special Sunday in our country. Does anybody know what today is? June 14th today. It is Flag Day. Every year, June 14th is set aside as Flag Day. Now, it's not really a national holiday or a federal holiday, but it's a day we can honor our flag. Why do we even have flags? Does anybody know? Flags are to show that we belong to a community or an organization or a nation, then that we share beliefs and, and goals and rules and regulations. So today, we honor our flag. I'm sure you can see that this is the flag of our country, the flag of the United States. And this is the flag, as you know, that we want to honor today. Now, what color is our flag? I know you guys know the answer to that. That's right, it's red, white, and blue. Have you ever stopped to think what those colors of our flag means? Well, the red, as you see, our red stripes, the red stands for courage. Many men and women sacrificed their lives and their time and showed us courage to fight for our country and to defend our country against enemies. And they've died in the service of our country. And then we have white. And the white stands for purity. Purity just means doing what's right. And we hope and pray that our country will always stand for what's right. And of course, we have the blue. The blue stands for justice. And you know, we pledge allegiance to our flag and we say, with liberty and justice for all. That just means everyone should be treated fairly and with respect. So the colors red, white, and blue remind us of our country. But you know, those colors remind me of something else. They also remind me of Jesus. And that brings up another flag that I hope we honor on Flag Day. That is, do you know what this flag is? It's our Christian flag. And I know that you have noticed it's also red, white, and blue. It also has those same colors. But the red of this flag, you see, is in a cross. So that reminds us of the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for us. The white reminds us that when we give our heart to Jesus, we are washed white as snow. The Bible says you are washed and you are sanctified. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The blue reminds us of God's faithfulness. The Bible tells us that if we confess our sins, he's faithful to us and will forgive us and make us clean. Both flags are red, white, and blue. I'm reminded of our country, but most importantly, I'm reminded of the love of Jesus Christ. So today, when you look at our flag and you think of our Christian flag, remember, God is with us. He loves us. He forgives us. And we pray that God protects us in our country. Let's say a prayer. Father, thank you so much for our nation. We ask that you would bless it and bless us. We are thankful for Jesus Christ who forgives us of our sins. Please be with us this week. Help us to be good stewards to our country and to God. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us, guys. Thank you so much, Bess. Our gospel lesson today comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew. Chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. And I invite you to hear now these words of instruction Jesus gives to the disciples. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him.
but some doubt. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will y'all pray with me? Almighty God, we praise you for the knowledge that indeed you are always with us. Lord, we pray that we would hear your calling to discipleship here today anew, that you would enliven our hearts through your Holy Spirit. For it is in your name, and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen. At the end of each gospel, there exists what are called commissioning statements. These are the final words Jesus gives to his disciples before he ascends to God the Father. And because they are the last words of Jesus, we tend to place an awful lot of importance on them. And what we read today at the end of Matthew is what is commonly called the Great Commission. Now, now, it's called the Great Commission not because the commissions in Luke or in Mark or in John are, are bad or anything like that, but, but it's called the Great Commission because when the church has needed a rallying cry, when we have needed a vision to get behind, it has been Matthew 28 that we've turned to. In fact, in the United Methodist Book of Discipline, and, and I know as good Methodists, you read your Book of Discipline every single night, but... But there in paragraph 120, it says, The mission of the local church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Now, we didn't get that because we're so smart or so intellectual or so theologically astute or, or anything like that. We got it right here from Matthew chapter 28. It is a big calling that Jesus gives to the disciples on this day. But, but it's more than just a calling that Jesus offers those disciples and all anywhere who will ever want to wear the title of disciple. It represents a change in status. See, now Jesus is calling these disciples not simply to be hearers, not simply to be followers. He is calling them to be leaders, to be doers. As we all know, very often there is a wide gulf that exists between hearing about something and actually doing it. Y'all, I've been at this church for, for about a year now. And, and one of the first things Teresa ever showed me in the church was how to transfer a phone call to a different line. It is a year later now, and I still can't get it right. You see, between hearing and doing, there's a gap. There's a gulf that exists there. It is the same with the disciples when they hear Jesus' commissioning statement to them on this day that they have heard all about how they are to go and make disciples. They, they've heard about what it is they are supposed to do, but now, now they are tasked with actually doing it. Between hearing and doing, there can exist a gap. The disciples are about to learn that on this day. Oh, it's wonderful to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. To, to hear about the love and about the freedom and about the forgiveness that Christ so freely offers us. To hear that salvation is not some far off distant goal that we have to strive for, that we have to earn, but that it's here, it's present. It's a reality. Could there be any better news than that? But Jesus doesn't call us to simply stop at hearing. Jesus doesn't say, now that you have heard the gospel, it's all good. Everything's good. You just go on about your life, does it? One night I, I was working at the community kitchen. 
in Kent. It's a, it's a little place where folks from all walks of life can come and get a hot meal every single night. And all the churches band together to support that valuable ministry. Our church was cooking one night, and, and you get to know the regulars. One of the regulars, a man by the name of Willie, came up to me and he said, You're the preacher, right? And I said, I am. And Willie said, You know, I used to go to church. And, and I got to tell you, as a preacher, when someone tells you they used to do something, like I used to go to church, nothing good is going to come after that sentence. But, but Willie said, You know, I used to go to church and even got saved. And I said, well, why'd you stop going to church? Well, he said, well, I figured once I'd gotten saved, that's all there was to it. I figured someone else could use my place in the pew. Jesus says, hearing the gospel makes a demand on your life. Hearing the gospel requires that we live out the gospel. And if we are to live out the gospel, friends, living into this commission is part and parcel of what it means to go to make disciples, to baptize, to teach, to instruct. There's no two ways about it. Now the disciples don't know it as they stand at the base of this mountain with Jesus on this day. But, but what Jesus charges them with will change the world forever. Indeed, we can gather together here in Cherryville, North Carolina, because the disciples were faithful to this calling that they had received. Had they just shrugged their shoulders and gone back to their old lives, I guarantee you, we wouldn't be here today. But they will change the world. And they do that through living into this commission that Jesus Christ gives them. Now, I've always found it uh, amazing that that when Jesus is raised from the dead, he, he doesn't go back to Pilate and say, come on, you want to take another shot? He, he doesn't run back to Caiaphas, the high priest, and say, you missed me, now you can't get me, now do you believe I'm the Messiah? No, Jesus goes to the disciples. And the first thing Jesus tells them is it's time to get back to work. He says, all authority and in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you to the end of the age. Now when Jesus first gave that call to the disciples, it, it, it must have seemed absolutely strange. Something completely unprecedented. It must have seemed impossible to those disciples to think that they could ever have any hope of accomplishing what it is Jesus has charged them with. Now, remember, these disciples, they, they're not the best and the brightest. They didn't go to seminary. They didn't take preaching 101, evangelism 202. They haven't had those public speaking courses. No, they're fishermen. They're day laborers. They're tax collectors. If you were picking people to be evangelists, these disciples would be at about the bottom of the list. And what complicates this mission, what, what makes it so much harder, is that Jesus is sending them to Rome. He's sending them to Israel. That's a culture and a society that believed they knew who God was. They believed they knew what God expected of them. But when God took flesh... When God walked among them, they rejected him. Jesus is calling these disciples to go and be about that same mission, to go and do what he has done. Now, if they crucified Jesus for living into this mission, what hope of success could these disciples possibly have? Jesus has spent three years going about this mission. He's done amazing signs. He's healed. He's taught. He's given the best sermons the world has ever heard. And at the end of the Gospels, we're told there are about 80 disciples who follow. Three years. He fed 20,000 people with five loaves and two fish. And he's only got 80. And, and here he is charging these disciples, not simply with continuing that mission, but with expanding that mission. How does he Think they could possibly do this. But 
between hearing and doing. There, there exists a goal. And, and you'll notice Jesus, he doesn't tell these disciples how it is they are to go about this mission. Jesus simply says go. He doesn't say, here's the four scriptures you're going to use to talk to the Jewish authorities. He, he doesn't say, here's how you're going to talk to the Roman authorities. Here's a nice script for you. Or here's the six steps to salvation. You give these to everybody. They'll want to follow you. No, Jesus simply says, go. But I got to tell you, I, I think it's kind of beautiful that that, that go is so open-ended. You know, if Jesus had given us a checklist, if Jesus had said, these are the six things you have to do before you can experience salvation, we could all follow that checklist. It, it would be nice, it would be fun to check off each little box, but, but once you checked it off, you'd be done. There, there would be nothing else there for you. It would seem to be, well, quite boring. Jesus hasn't called us to a boring life. God didn't send his son so that we could be bored. God sent his son to light a fire underneath each and every one of us. To, to follow Jesus Christ, to live into this commission means we don't ever have an excuse to be bored. Discipleship is it's not a spectator sport. It's something that we do each and every day. When we wake up and say, I am going to love and serve God today. I am going to love and serve my neighbors today. There's no end to it. It doesn't matter if you start it when you're four years old, when you're 95, you will still be living into this commission. I think that's amazing. Jesus says to go. In, in seminary, I, I took a class called Mission in the Local Church. It, it was taught by this retired United Methodist bishop, a, a man by the name of Will Williman. And every single class started with us reading Matthew 28, 16 through 20, the Great Commission. And after we read it, Willowman would tell us some kind of, of story about mission in the local church, when it had worked, when it hadn't. One day he said to us, you know, when I was bishop in Alabama, one of the most amazing things to me was how many of our churches and many of our pastors didn't just die a poor so they, they existed in these radically changing communities. There were new people moving in all around these churches, and it seemed all they wanted to do was sit inside the church. They didn't want to take any chances, take any leaps of faith. And Willman said, I'm convinced that, that it won't be atheism that kills the church, and, and it won't be secularism that kills the church, but it will be bored. And I'm convinced that the best way, perhaps the only way to avoid getting bored in our walk with Christ is to live into this great commission. Now, while Willman may have lacked tact, I, I do believe he was right. Jesus loves us too much to hand us over to boring lives. Jesus gives us a mission. He gives us a calling. Jesus says to go, to go. And I think that's such a profound calling. Of course, I've also noticed that, that sometimes in my own life and, and sometimes in the life of the church, we, we get more interested in studying that calling to go than we actually do going. You know, I'm the proud father of a, a four-year-old and a two-year-old, Eli and, and Ellen. But if I tell them to go and clean their playroom, they understand what it is I'm asking of them. They might not always do it, but at least they understand what it is I'm asking. They don't come back to me after 30 minutes and go, Dad, we memorized what you said. You said go clean the playroom. They don't say, we even learned how to say it in, in Greek and in Hebrew. In fact, Dad, we got a group of our friends together and and we studied what it would look like if we actually started to clean our playroom. No, they understand. They, they know that to go means a call to action. It, it means they have to get going. It's the same when you're at work. If your boss tells you to go and do something, you don't just sit around. No, you go and you do. Now, if we can understand that calling to go, Everywhere else, why would we think that Jesus Christ expects any less of us than we expect of those around us? He has called us 
to go to make disciples, to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and to teach them to obey everything that he has commanded of us. And he does that with the word go. Now, I've got some good news for us today. In order for us to live into this commission, in order for us to fulfill the mission that Jesus Christ has called us to, we, we don't have to go to the Amazon and hack our way through rainforest to find some lost tribe. No, no we live in Cherryville, where we know that, that the population is about 5,500 people. About 2,600 people regularly go to worship. That means that about one out of every two people in this community has yet to know the redemptive good news of Jesus Christ, has yet to experience the life-changing event of baptism. It tells us that, friends, the mission field is here. The harvest is plenty. And Jesus hasn't given us really a choice as to whether or not we will accept that mission. Jesus says, if you want to follow me, indeed, you have to go. So, friends, as, as First United Methodist Church, I, I want to tell you, I am excited to get going. And I know you are too. To go to announce the kingdom of God. To share the good news of Jesus Christ. To live into this commission. It's in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we are saved. Amen. We all pray with me. Good and gracious God, you love us enough to expect more of us than very often we expect of ourselves. Lord, we, we pray that you would empower us to be about your mission, to share your good news. We pray that we would be empowered through the presence of your Holy Spirit, that we might live into your great commission. For it is in your holy name and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we do pray. And now we will receive the all. to you a small portion of what you have so richly blessed us with. Lord, we pray that you would take these gifts of our tithes and of our offerings, that you would use them how you see fit, that they might be to the benefit of your kingdom and to the glory of your holy name. For it is in your name and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we do pray. Now, brothers and sisters, as, as we leave from this place on this day, pray that you will hear Christ calling to go, to go and to make disciples, and that we will live into this each and every day by waking up, saying, I am ready to love and serve God and love and serve my neighbor today. For it is in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit we are saved.